And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome to the Teach Thought Podcast. Terry, introduce yourself. My name is Terry Ike. I'm a former classroom teacher and now director at Teach Thought, which means I do a lot of different things very badly. And I'm Drew Perkins. I'm the director of professional development here at Teach Thought, and hopefully that means I do a lot of different things really well. And together we're hosting a podcast, which hopefully makes Teach Thought more accessible to you in more places, right, Drew? Well, hopefully, yeah, but mostly it's just me hosting it because you just add episodes every so often, right? Well, you know, I've got things to do. Remember, I'm director. That's true. As always, if you're interested in professional development from TeachThought, you can navigate on over to our website at teachthought.com forward slash PD. You can find things in our services menu. You'll pull down and see lots of different workshop options. But of course, we invite you to personalize your PD by contacting us and making it work for you. In today's podcast, I spoke with Tom Markham, the mind behind Global PBL and the designer of an online course called Experience PBL, an intro to PBL course online that you can find at www.introtopbl.com. We talked about the difference between just doing projects and what he would call world-class project-based learning, as well as what project-based learning online looks like in his course. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Markham. Uh, we're here to talk about the online PBL course, a global PBL, and uh, let's start by by diving into um, the difference in your mind, and, and I think it's really important to differentiate the difference between what people might think of as projects and what really world-class project-based learning is. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Uh, I think this is on your mind and my mind and the minds of many teachers as they try to move towards project-based learning. Uh, What we're really trying to do is elevate the whole conversation around projects and take it into what I would call a a new level, a new standard, a new realm if you want to, and that's doing world-class project-based learning, which involves a number of elements that distinguish uh, PBL from the old style projects. Uh, Most of us know what those old style projects look like. They were done towards the end of the year once you finish the real learning or they were the icing on the cake as some people say. You do the real stuff in the classroom then you get out of your chair and have some fun and do a project. So PBL is not that. That, PBL is really a set of design principles that when you put them together create a much more powerful project with much more powerful outcomes. Uh, And those principles are, uh, to my mind, uh, you start with having a great question or problem, a good driving question, as I would call it, and that driving question is your true north for the project. It's what uh, students are answering or it is the problem to be solved as students go through the project. So once you get that and that captures the challenge and the direction for the project, then you kind of, from my standpoint, move into uh, how would you know if the kids answered the question, what kind of products would they give you, what kind of presentations or public performances would they do, and how would you put some assessment and evaluation around that, which in in the case of PBO means using really good, solid, well-defined performance rubrics. So those are what I call the bookends to great PBL, a good driving question, a solid assessment and set of projects. And then as students move through this process, some very well-defined design principles for how you use student teams, what the teams do in the course of the project, how they do research, how they gather evidence, how they uh, draft up responses to answering the driving question or the pr- solving the problem. Uh, all moving down this track uh, towards the end of the project in which they're going to demonstrate how well they've solved this problem or answered this question. It's always an open-ended question. It's always, uh, in a sense, an open-ended problem. And what you're looking for in this uh, PBL journey is evidence of really good thinking, really good analysis, and then the ability to communicate their findings to a public audience. So some of, those are some of the design principles that really uh, distinguish uh, PBL from 
old style projects. So as we think about uh, that difference between projects and project-based learning, uh, and sometimes project ba- project-based learning gets a bad rap. Certainly, we've seen it, and in our work over the years, working with schools and teachers, uh, you know, you go in to to do a face-to-face workshop, and we've done lots of those, and those can be very powerful. Uh, but we, you know, you sometimes get pushback from folks who say. All right. Yeah, I've done. I've been doing project-based learning for 20 years. It's it's okay or whatever. And what they really have been doing in a lot of cases, not every case, but a lot of cases, is more of that culminating project, that starting at the bottom of Bloom's taxonomy, saying, "All right, I'm going to sort of pre-teach or front-load whatever language you want to use," uh, and then I'm going to at the end, they've learned all this stuff, and now I'm going to climb them up the Bloom's taxonomy to apply and create, which is now at the top, and away we go, right? Wonderful. Now, certainly that's wor- that's better than what we might see in some classrooms, a traditional drill and kill lecture, that kind of stuff, but that is not what we call project-based learning. So um, I'm curious how you talk about that and think about that difference between, in, in, in maybe in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. Yeah, that's a good one, Drew. I actually uh, have thought a lot about that and, like you, have encountered a lot of that. I find it's uh, actually old-style projects focus on, I would call, understanding, awareness. Uh, Kids get out and do something and uh, they've sort of learned about something. Uh, PBL is really designed to move kids up that taxonomy right to the very top to critical thinking and creativity. Now I must say I still find a lot of projects uh, under the guise of PBL are really uh, about awareness and understanding uh, rather than problem solving and so what I try to keep in mind and what I try to convey when I'm working with teachers is this is a problem solving process. As a matter of fact one of the best tests that I've found in the last couple of years for teachers to be able to distinguish the two is to ask them as they describe their project what is the problem to be solved what is the question to be answered and it surprises me and surprises them that when they look at their driving question they actually realize it's more about awareness and understanding the bottom of that taxonomy than it is about doing some critical analysis and problem solving so that's one test is there a problem to be solved is there a question to be answered and uh, it's uh, that really depends on having a really good driving question so for example uh, you might see a a driving question which would be very common uh, how do we uh, how do we contribute to solving the issue of climate change on the planet that's kind of a big one right but that's a typical one right Uh, the fact is that if you've got a seventh grade classroom, they're probably not going to solve the problem of climate change across the planet. That's not really their problem. They're going to contribute. So what I would do in a case like that is say, what actions can we take within our school or in our local community to contribute to solving that problem? That creates a real problem. That creates something, what do we actually do? So I think the driving question is really critical in how far up that taxonomy the students are really going to go. Yeah, the one, one of the things that I like to do that, that I think is really helpful in clarifying some of those things and making it more actionable and, and more problem-based um, or, or pragmatic, if you will, instead of sort of this big generality and, and um, you know, big, huge problem, which certainly global um, – you know, warming or, or climate change is certainly important, but like you said, it doesn't really, it, it's just almost so so vague, it's, it's really hard to, to get at. So let's really clarify what's the product, what's the purpose, and who's that authentic audience? Um, so even getting to the point of saying, well, let's, let's really start that, start that driving question out, like how can we do, what are we going to do, what's our, what's our product, what are the students going to make and create, which to me gets us started at the top of Bloom's taxonomy and we're already asking kids to create 
and y and you know, so how can we do blank so that blank and that's our y that's our purpose right so what is what is the reason that we're doing this and then who's our authentic audience and and you know when we think about the the teach thought five levers of quality i think you're you're hitting on lots of them that rich inquiry uh, certainly is really, really important, that driving question, but inquiry throughout um, and making that work authentic um, where it, it really is a, an actionable, a real problem that they're, that they're working on. Um, so I, I think there's a, a humongous value in that. Um, so when you think then more about best practices, what is it that makes um, the, the PBL – in in your eyes more world class i mean everything is sort of a journey and a sliding scale and a and a, a spectrum right so how do we continue that journey journey and what are the things that make it more world class in your in your eyes well i come back to the driving question i think that we as pbl practitioners and teachers as pbl designers uh, need to get much better designing these driving questions that really do point in the same direction you just talked about, specific actionable problems to be solved. Under the guise of good driving questions, there's still a lot of desire just to promote awareness. So that's one area that really distinguishes, I think, world-class projects from just what I would call ordinary PBL. Uh, I would say a second one is sort of the end is who is seeing that those products and that information that the students is producing because you know like I do the more public the audience the more that the audience is capable of critiquing the presentation uh, the better the performance gets for students and as I say you may often say you may say the same thing uh, to a teacher you are the audience of least interest to your students nothing personal right. but that's true and it, and really what you want to do is get those kids get that work outside the classroom. Now, it can't always go uh, before a public audience at the city hall. That's not always possible, but it can go in a hallway, it can go in a cafeteria, it can go someplace that somebody sees it that, that it matters, and of course there's all sorts of digital possibilities to get, the, get it out electronically as well. Right. It has to go out the, out of the classroom. So that's really a world-class practice that I think at this point is simply a proven best practice in terms of uh, notching up student performance. Uh, you know, kids are like adults or anybody else. Uh, they like to do well in front of an audience that matters. And once they do that, they get a sense of their capability that I think changes them as a learner. Because once you've experienced that, you don't go backwards. You know what it feels like. So I think that's really critical. And of course, that's one of the elements that allows PBL to take root in a school as kids do more projects across more subjects and grade levels and this becomes part of the fabric of a school this public performance performance in general among kids goes up and uh, one of the criticisms against PBL has been well it doesn't prepare kids for tests but I don't find that to be true at all once you have reached that takeoff point where kids are engaged uh, and that culture I call them kind of going in a flock in one direction test scores do not only do well they usually go up so that's a world-class practice. And then I think that the third one, I think we're, we're still a work in progress on this, frankly, and that is to get student teams to collaborate at an intellectual level, to move from the notion of cooperative learning and group work to teams of kids working for a purpose, exchanging ideas, giving feedback to one another, critiquing each other, using basic protocols like I like, I wonder, I suggest to each other, having teams present their prototypes and ideas to one another, and making this sort of the heart of the project process as kids are learning so that their, their learning truly is collaborative, but collaborative for a purpose. Uh, to me, that's, uh, it, well, it's obvious, I think, to everyone, that's the way of the world. It's what the workforce is looking for. It's what universities do these days, and uh, it's what business schools do these days. And so, to my mind, every student, before they, uh, by the time they graduate at 18 from a uh, K-12 system, they should have had some pretty good experience in how to work in a team in a, for deeper purpose and with deeper accountability. Well, isn't it interesting, too? I think the... 
one one of the blog pieces on Teach Thought that I had contributed is about what PBL can do for a school and and teachers and for students and um, I, you know building upon what what you talked about there the the value of peer critique and collaboration um, uh, not that collaboration as uh, one of our common friends might might joke about but uh, really getting that value you know one of the things that I think is really really important and vital and and essential is that it's not only the students doing that but it's the teachers and then the adults doing Doing that you know that the leadership is is addressing and it's just a really a big culture shift and a culture change where we're not doing the the, the same things we've always done of evaluation or silos or isolated teachers but you're evaluating each other's work and um in using those same kinds of protocols and i think those those things are are great for kids and uh, and i know you agree that they're great for adults and uh Boy, what a shift that would make in our schools and our teaching and learning um, if we really did make those kinds of shifts. So let's let's talk about why why do we want to do this online? Because now we're talking about PBL in general, but uh, our new offering here is this online e-course. And why and how does online uh, PBL work? And what does this what does this look like? Well, I think the the goal is to scale world-class PBL uh, and get it out there to as many teachers as possible. So uh, I calculated the other day there are 1.8 billion adolescents to be educated. Uh, that requires a lot of teachers and a lot of curriculum, etc. Uh, even though the number of PBL, I would say, experts and consultants and trainers has increased considerably, in the last uh, five to ten years, particularly over the last five years, there's never going to be enough expertise to get this to the number of teachers who really need to know the basics of good project-based learning. Now, I think when you know the basics of good project-based learning, that also leads you into other fields such as blended learning, personalized learning, inquiry-based methods. It's really one conversation as I see it. And uh, it does open your mind and help you create a mindset of personalization, student-centered, etc., and problem solving. So uh, scaling it is important. It's critical, I think, actually. to It's a critical mission to scale this, to get this out uh, in the U.S., North America, uh, all over, really, uh, and, and get this out to folks so they can get a glimpse of how to do this and obviously the way we do this is we put it online yeah uh, I can't tell you how often we get uh, I get emails uh, as director of PD here pretty frequently from folks saying I want help with PBL um, but they're an individual they're an individual teacher and they're in the United States or they're in Thailand or I mean really all over the world and you know of course it's not scalable to go to a workshop on site for one person so to take this online and to start building capacity asynchronously in an online format i think is is really you know can, is a great innovation and we're hoping that that can be a really you know like you said really starting to germinate and and amplify and elevate this uh, best practices, world-class PBL. So how do we make that robust, though? Because I think probably most folks have, uh, I know I've, I've engaged in some online courses. Uh, maybe some folks out there have, have taken MOOCs, and, and this is not a MOOC. Um, it certainly has some elements of lots of the, the things that we've we've seen and done. I've had some really poor experiences with online courses. I'm guessing lots of folks have as well. So what makes this robust or how do we how do we make this robust? Well, at first, I think first uh, we distinguish this from, as you said, uh, traditional online work, which is uh, often a matter of reading a PDF and downloading it and answering some questions or listening to a talking head. Or in the case of MOOC, that's really just a digital lecture in which you're receiving information, which has its value, but it's not really what we're talking about. Sure. It's not a webinar. You don't have to call in at a certain time or be at your desk at a certain time. So that, the, the platform that, uh, that I'm using and TeachThought is using to do the online work is uh, 
really one that I discovered about a year ago through Massive U, uh, which has created what I consider to be the most advanced kind of a leading edge uh, digital platform that's out there. Uh, it's gamified, it has a leaderboard, it has badges, it has uh, a very strong social media component so you're constantly in touch with your cohort if you choose to form one as you go through the course asking questions, sharing ideas, giving feedback, uh, very immersive, very problem oriented, very real world best practices oriented and very much uh, designed or uh, created around these world class design principles. So, I mean from my standpoint, uh, Drew, the first thing is to make sure that you have uh, uh, a really robust platform that allows you to do what I call uh, considering all the moving parts of PBL. There's just a lot of stuff to think about when you're designing a project and so you need a complex form of uh, uh, planning and yet a simple enough platform that you can do that. So the Massive View platform is terrific that way. I think it just really does allow for the, as you, the word you used, the robust, the, the robustness and the complexity of PBL to be captured in an online digital planning course. So uh, teachers who go through this plan a course, they consider all the elements of what's required including what your classroom culture looks like, how are you going to form your teams, what your question or problem going to be, uh, how are you going to incorporate 21st century skills into your project, uh, how are you going to sustain PBL, uh, how are you going to inject your project with some innovation and creativity and some opportunities for kids to do work that we may not define for them but they may show us. Uh, so that robustness is now possible with all that uh, in this online platform. So from that standpoint I think we've really um, done something here that has not been done before and it's I think it's going to be uh, a terrific tool for teachers uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, it's, I think it fits whether you're doing IB work or you're doing uh, Common Core or you've got some other national curriculum. Uh, I, think it, I think it works very well because these principles of design and PBL are really universal. They're, it, it's in some ways not rocket science as the saying goes. It's just a design process in which you have a problem or a question and you design a learning experience around that at the end of the experience the kids give you work that shows that they have engaged the problem and have done something meaningful with it so these are universal principles and I think this the course will uh, does a good job of speaking to those yeah the massive view platform has uh, is really visually the the user interface is is really nice there's elements of uh collaboration and like you said sort of social media ish uh kind of things as well as the gamification and some folks say well i don't like gamification well you don't have to be competitive uh it's not something that you have to do in there but it is an option and you you sort of have a leaderboard and so there's a there's a fun element of that uh, but the, the real focus is, of course, on the learning and building of capacity around PBL concepts. Um, and I, I love the idea, uh, as we think about it being used in a number of different contexts, and, and we can talk about, you know, what you and I uh, and our listeners as teachers, you, you know, we have certainly there's a pushback in a lot of cases around what, uh, professional development really looks like and what it has looked like um, and here at Teach that we're really working hard to try to uh, to innovate that space but um, you know sort of getting away from sitting in a, you know a room with a bunch of people um, listening to somebody and, and it's certainly not what our workshops look like but it's a lot what a lot of people have been ex have been exposed to uh, so, you know, you might take this individually to build your capacity. Um, I'm also seeing it as a, as a nice hybrid to do some on-site, face-to-face work, uh, sort of a flip blended model, kind of as you mentioned. So um, thinking about how the different ways that we can use this and, and what does that look like in your mind as far as uh, teachers engaging in it in different ways? The way it looks in my mind is... Uh 
close to what you just described, I think for some teachers this is going to be a standalone experience. I want to learn more about PBL. Now, in the course, uh, anyone taking the course is strongly encouraged and is rewarded uh, for establishing a cohort or colleagues to go through the course with. Uh, you and I both know that uh, PBL benefits from conversation right. and from collaboration. And in fact, in some ways, if you don't have that, you kind of uh, lose heart because you don't want to be the only one in the school doing PBL. Uh, it, it just that's not sustainable. So the cohort works, and I think that's really important for quality. Uh, so a standalone, you can do it, but it's going to be much better if you have like a grade level team or. Uh, uh, or as I was, I was uh, speaking with a school this morning actually about this, and they're going to use it to in which all their new new faculty, so five to ten new people as they come on board, will all take the course together, and they will act as a cohort. And uh, when you finish the course, you do come out with an e-portfolio. You come out with a project that's planned. You come out with uh, sort of a profile of how much you know about PBL. So that's very useful. Uh, then I think uh, I think from your standpoint and my standpoint, it'd be great to get a school taking this and using this as a, uh, a what I would call a knowledge uh, knowledge development tool for the staff that can be made available. Uh, can be used in a blended environment. Uh, certainly, uh, can uh, someone like you or myself or another PBL uh, consultant or trainer or, or someone with PBL knowledge can frame the course by starting off for a day, this is what you're going to learn, this is the important parts, let's set some deadlines as to when you're going to have it done, let's look at the quality of the project that you've designed online. So it's going to work in different ways and I think uh, as we go on with this, uh, we will find uh, more ways for it to be used and figure out what this flipped or blending model looks like, uh, blended model looks like, because uh, Again, PBL benefits from conversation among teachers. It also benefits from conversation with somebody who's been there and kind of walked the path of PBL before. So uh, I think that's helpful too. Uh, I think it can also be combined with uh, coaching. Uh, that could be on site. Somebody shows up every couple of months, discuss the projects, go through what you're getting, uh, even participates in the course as an online facilitator or virtual support through uh, Skype coaching and uh, so forth. I've done that very successfully with uh, teachers who are going through PBL training. And so there's just a variety of ways it can be used, but I think the bottom line, Drew, for me is this is now a key tool for teaching PBL and for sharing PBL best practices. And the time has come, and as you and I know and we have discussed, Teachers don't want to sit in a room receiving information that may or may not be personalized to their needs, neither do students. We're asking students to be extremely active and engaged and to personalize their experience to some extent. We're asking them to go online and use their devices and their phones and everything else. We now, as professional development folks and teachers, can also, not can, I think are required to take that path as well and to immerse yourself in certain technologies are going to be very useful for professional development because it's less expensive, it less, takes less time, you don't need substitutes, you don't need dedicated professional development days. All those things that get in the way of, of good professional development really are gone with this and it's uh, on your device, on your phone if you want to. Yeah, it's it's almost uh, it kind of makes me think of uh, you know <laughs> you look back when we were young and the idea of you know the joke about jetpacks and flying cars and video phones which uh, some of those things are obviously coming true we've got Skype and Google Hangouts and uh, those kinds of things you know like so technology I think is really catching up to a point uh, with bandwidth and with uh, computers uh, or the processor speeds and those kinds of things uh, but also the design and, and the development of products like the Massive View that we're engaging with to do this kind of work I think it's really caught up to a point that is that I think it, it's uh, it's got the momentum and we can do the things that we really want to and you know sort of in a yes and approach and the, the building upon ideas I'm excited about seeing where this goes because uh, we know that it's an innovation we 
think that it'll be very, very powerful for teachers and schools in a number of different ways. Um, and it'll be fun to see where where people take it and where we can take it and how we can continue to leverage it. So when you when we talk about the logistics and, and bare bones, uh, you know, folks will be able to, to register and can register on the website. Uh, it's uh, $99 for one seat. If, so if an individual wants to take it, if it's a school that wants to, uh, to engage a group, it's uh, something they can do for $999 for 50 seats. And so that's a great deal. And uh, kind of get that cohort thing going as you mentioned but uh what's the you know taking it's asynchronous and how much time does it take and what does that look like well it, it's uh teachers are reporting that it's taking about six hours to get through the course now of course you can do that over a semester you can do it in two days if you want to uh so you're on your you're at your own pace but about six hours total to go through the course and experience it directly, which probably would be the equivalent of about two days worth of sitting in a regular PD workshop. So that's about the amount of time it takes. Again, it's uh, it's individualized, and uh, it depends on how quickly a teacher wants to do it. They may decide to do 30 minutes a week for a semester or something like that. It really depends on how, again, how focused you want to be on the course. So. But about six hours, it's 12 tiles. It starts off with uh, uh, some, uh, the culture, the skills, and moves all the way through the design process to, at the end, uh, doing a critical friends or tuning protocol together with your cohort to discuss the quality of your project. So it's, uh, it's, it's comprehensive. And, uh, you know, it also has a lot of resources in there that you can, that you're directed to if you want to use them. So in an attempt to personalize this experience, you can go to deep into other websites as you want to. For example, there's a lot of references on there to uh, teach thought resources. You could read more blogs. You could go a lot of different directions with this. So it's personalized uh, to what you need to do, which I think is great. Well, great. Um, Tom, any last uh, sort of things you want to leave the listeners with on this course? You know, I just want to say, Drew, uh, you and I talked a bit, and I, I just to re- is it, reiterate this, it's interesting to me to watch the nature of professional development shifting so quickly, and as people move out of wanting, of not wanting to uh, do a seat time form of professional development where they're the passive recipients of uh, someone talking at them, and they move to more engagement in terms of the online course, it's going to be interesting to watch how engaged uh, teachers are willing to be because it is easier as we know from teachers dealing with students for te- for students to be sitting there listening or half listening or look like they're listening but not really listening uh, rather than really being active learners and so uh, as teachers in our profession these days we're expected to be active learners ourselves and that is what the online course really requires it is an active learning experience and I will be sort of watching as we as teachers make this transition from being uh, sort of the passive uh, uh, consumers of professional development to becoming active participants in their own development absolutely well tom it's been great talking with you and i appreciate you being on thanks so much drew i appreciate it also all right that'll do it for today's podcast thanks so much for listening and if you didn't hate it please leave us a review on itunes or wherever you're listening and share it on social media wherever you feel comfortable speaking of social media you can find us in all the normal places like facebook twitter google plus linkedin pinterest and please share us on those places as well and don't forget about teach thought professional development you can find us there at teachthought.com forward slash pd